My video on Netflix's The Witcher was supposed to come out several months ago, during the zenith of the hype for the show, when everyone was very much interested in it, when the memes were bombarding us all the damn time, and it was a big deal for at least a few weeks. And had I done the video back then, my impressions of it would have been drastically different than what I'm about to say today. While I probably would have acknowledged some things that I hated even back then, such as most of the stuff regarding Nilfgaard, Triss Marigold, Fringilla Vigo, and how some of the stories storylines weren't adapted as good as they could be, I probably would have been overall much more positive about the show than I am inevitably going to be today. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, what has changed between a few months ago and right now? Well, for one thing, the hype train of the show has considerably died down. It's no longer this big mega deal that everyone has to fawn over, and now with cooler heads, we can look at it a bit more objectively. But the second and far more important reason I'm going to be much less kind to the show today has to do with my recent reread of the books. See, I originally read the official translations for The Witcher series by David French, and look, no offense to the man, he is a good translator, he gets the points across, he does a pretty damn good job, even great in certain points. But some of the eloquence of the writing, some of Sepkowski's wordplay, the way he describes things, the way he has characters do their back and forth, isn't as well translated into English as I think it could have been. And after doing some research, I was able to come across some early fan translations back when the official ones in English were not completed, and I'm doing my latest reread of the books through those. And while those obviously have some issues, they are fan translations, of course, so they're not professionally done. One advantage of the fan translations is the fact that those keep the eloquence of Sepkowski's prose much more intact. The way the words flow from one another, the way things are described, it all feels much more lively, much more energetic than in the David French translation. And in particular, the dialogue feels much more heartfelt, much more emotional, or in the case of humorous scenes, much snappier than before. And because the delivery of all these disparate elements of the books are delivered with much more grace in the fan-translated version, a lot of the subtleties, a lot of the emotions, a lot of the themes and ideas that are presented in the various Witcher storylines are conveyed much more effectively. And in fact, it's thanks to these fan translations and digging deeper and deeper into what the Witcher series is truly about has made me appreciate the books and their various messages much, much more in this latest read-through than anywhere before. And it's precisely because of my renewed understanding of what these short stories were trying to do that makes the Netflix adaptation look like such a piece of shit, if I'm going to be blunt. Which is not to say that everything associated with the Netflix series is bad. Some of the costume design is great, I like a lot of the music. I think that most of the actors in their respective roles are well cast. And I think that with a much better script, with better writers, with a better showrunner, this show could have turned out to be pretty damn solid, all things considered. And yet it is the writing where everything goes to hell, specifically in the way they choose to adapt certain elements, or just completely bastardize certain other ones for the sake of, I guess, pushing an agenda, or because they can't fucking read in some instances. Now, I'm not going to do a complete list of all my grievances with Netflix's The Witcher. There's a lot of things that I could sift through, but I'm only going to name some of the things that pop into my head during this recording the most. And one of the biggest differences and one of the best exemplars of how much the show degraded a good character is Calanthe, the great lioness of Sintra, one of the most respected monarchs in the entire Witcher universe. A queen of such renown, of such strength of character, that her death did nothing to diminish her own power. Even after Nilfgaard conquered her kingdom, thousands upon thousands of loyal Sintrans still wanted to fight and die, not just for her granddaughter, but for Calanthe's memory as well. That's the kind of loyalty you can't just buy. You have to earn it through your own charisma and strength of character. And in the books, Calanthe only appears twice. And yet in both appearances, you can see why she is the Lioness of Sintra. She is able to make 
anyone feel like the most important person in the room or completely cut you down with a single glance, depending on what you say to her and how you choose to act in front of her. And it's the kind of respect everyone shows to her during the banquet and then later on during her second interaction with Geralt that she gets to showcase her knowledge of not just warfare, but internal politics, the professions of those who are not only in the nobility, her knowledge of how nobility works. She gets to showcase that she is knowledgeable about a great many things that an ordinary noble in the Witcher universe would not give a shit to know about, or they would just be too stupid or assholeish to care. She can match Geralt blow for blow during their various dialogue exchanges. And even though she does try to trick Geralt into doing something that he, a Witcher, should not do, after both instances where the two of them encounter one another, you can really get the impression that Geralt legitimately likes and respects Calanthe, which, considering the fact that, like I already said, many nobles in the Witcher universe are complete fucking idiots or bastards, that is no small feat. And if the circumstances behind their meetings were different, Calanthe and Geralt probably would have been legitimately good friends with one another. And it's precisely because Calanthe doesn't go around posturing, whinging, or complaining that she doesn't get this, this, or that, but rather calmly and collectively, for the most part, showcases her intellect, her strength of presence, and the way she's able to command that respect by just being in the same room with a whole bunch of other people that makes Geralt legitimately like and respect her, and by extension makes you the reader like her. Whereas Calanthe in the TV show is just a disaster area. Imagine if you took Cersei Lannister's constant whinging about wah 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 I was born with the tits and snatch and not a shaft and balls wah 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 and you turned that into a living breathing person. That is Calanthe in the TV show. A transparent overly compensating braggart who has none of Book Calanthe's grace or intellect constantly demanding respect instead of commanding it. The next big one that really irked the shit out of me is what they do with the Dopplers, because it is such a fundamental misunderstanding of Dopplers as an entire race, and also Dudu as a character, and the whole theme behind Dudu's story. See, in the area around Novograd, Dopplers used to thrive, that used to be their kind of homeland before humans came and took it over, and the whole theme of the Eternal Fire storyline, and also a bound of reason, is the fact that just because you're different doesn't mean that there's no place in the world for you. Just because your home might have never existed or you might have had a home before and it was taken from you by people who consider you a freak, a mutant, something that shouldn't exist, you can still find a home for yourself. You can still find a place in society for yourself by learning to adapt and grow with the world around you. And this is precisely the theme that is in play during the Eternal Fire story. Dudu is able to find a place in human society. He actually gets something like a family. He gets several friends. He gets kind of a job, too. A very successful job that he's also pretty damn good at. And it's a nice, hopeful message that reinforces what Borch 3 Jackdaws tells Geralt at the end of Bound of Reason that everyone has the potential to find a place for themselves in the world. And also, Dopplers as a species are not violent. They don't want to kill people, they don't want to really hurt anyone. Hell, it's the fact that they are such an intrinsically benevolent species that Geralt does not want to kill Dudu. In fact, Geralt is horrified, incredibly horrified by the very idea that he might have to kill Dudu at one point. And Dudu, who transforms into Geralt and can see what Geralt thinks and feels, calls him out on this. And Geralt is not one to hold his hand against evil. If Geralt thinks that you're a son of a bitch, who deserves the sword, he's gonna give it to you. Don't be fooled by his talk of emotionlessness and Witcher neutrality and the Witcher code. If Geralt meets a son of a bitch, that son of a bitch is gonna pay for it in one way or another. That's why The Eternal Fire is one of my favorite storylines in the entire Witcher universe, because despite the fact that it's so lighthearted and comedic and it's possibly the most relaxing of the stories, it still is able to reinforce the messages of the Witcher universe. Whereas the Doppler in the show is this psychotic freak who wants to, like, collect people's parts to create the perfect visage for himself, and Kahir uses him to steer Ciri out of Broccolon by pretending he's Mausak, and he's violent and obviously fucking crazy. And it just makes me wonder, did you motherfuckers read 
a single word of the Eternal Fire, or did you just include the Doppler because, hey, that's a thing from the short story, so let's just put it in while not understanding anything that makes a Doppler what he is. But the pants shitting stupidity does not stop there. What the hell is up with Geralt and Dandelion in the show? In the books, Geralt and Dandelion do get annoyed with one another. Dandelion, when he sees Geralt acting like a moody, bitchy, whining little teenager, calls him out on it and tells him, Look, Geralt, get your head out of your ass. I know what you're thinking. It's not that big of a deal. Chill the fuck out and just think things through. Meanwhile, Geralt will also call out Dandelion when he's acting like a moron, when he's being too selfish, or when his curiosity gets the better of him. And the two of them do butt heads over various things, but in spite of this, these two guys really do care about each other. They are legitimate best friends. Time and time again, Dandelion is willing to go through a hell and back just to help Geralt out, even though he knows he could die thousands and thousands of times on the way there, and Geralt would do the same for Dandelion. And these two do share actual moments of genuine friendship with one another, where you can buy that these two do like each other in spite of their considerable difference in character, and despite the fact that they can get on each other's nerves sometimes. And Sapkowski knows that friends will inevitably butt heads over stuff. They don't have to always get along to be friends. And the genuine nature of the fact that Sapkowski is willing to show how friendship can turn sometimes sour too is what makes it feel pretty legit in the books. In the show, Geralt just seems perpetually fucking angry. Dandelion is anywhere near him in almost every single scene. And I almost never buy that these two are ever friends. The only time I do is when Geralt bails Dandelion out of that noble trying to get him. Oh, and I also don't like the fact that Dandelion is whitewashed into not being a womanizer. Like, Dandelion, he screws more women than Geralt. That's part of his character. He is a chronic womanizer. And yet, in spite of being an obnoxious womanizer, Dandelion is also a very insightful, intelligent person. He knows how nobility works. He knows the various coats of arms. He's exceptionally good at reading people most of the time. Time, and he knows how to use his reputation to bail himself and Geralt out of problems, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But hey, that goes to show you that Dandelion is more than just this annoying asshole who keeps buzzing around Geralt's general vicinity all the time. And lastly, there is Geralt himself, who has also done no great favors by the show. Contrary to popular opinion, Geralt does not just say, hmm, and fuck all the damn time. In fact, Geralt is actually kind of a chatterbox. He has a big speech at, at least once in every single one of the short stories. The, the ironies of Geralt that make him so fun and interesting are that everyone assumes that he's just a dumb asshole who kills monsters and that he's an emotionless killing machine. First off, Geralt is one of the most intelligent characters in the entire setting. He is someone who is exceptionally well-read, he is very well familiar not just with things that he has to know as part of his trade, but he knows about world history, he knows about key historical figures, their backstories, where they ended up, how they lived, how they died. And this is what makes Geralt such a cool character, because you expect him to be this very specific kind of thing, and then as you peel back the layers, he is a fully formed person with a full emotional spectrum, a love for learning and a love for reading, and none of this is really present in the show. Like, when Geralt is silent and he doesn't say anything, you can tell just from the way he's acted in other situations that he's clearly thinking really, really hard and really in-depthly about things outside of his control. Whereas with the Netflix version, I never really get the sense that this guy is ever running anything in the back of his head. I never really get the sense that this guy is trying to piece things together or he's trying to figure stuff out that might help or hinder him. He's just there going, hmm, and fuck, and occasionally delivering an okay line or joke, but that's about it. Now, even the video games downgrade Geralt's verbosity to an extent, but even in the games, Geralt can, with the right choices and with the right dialogue picks, absolutely tear into someone verbally in spectacular fashion that would be worthy of a Sepkowski monologue. One of the best examples I can name specifically from the video games is his speech to Horson Jr., 
Yet the Netflix version has really none of this, and it's a shame. And I could honestly go on and on and on about other elements, such as everything concerning Nilfgaard ever. But I'm going to stop because I don't want this video to last three fucking hours. Instead, I'm going to end it on this note. Do I think that Netflix's Witcher is going to stay bad? I hope it doesn't. I hope that they grow a brain cell between their collective writing room and actually execute something better. But I just don't see it happening. The same creative people aren't miraculously gonna get a hundred times better writing this stuff than they were before. I think a lot of characters are going to keep getting bastardized. A lot of things are just going to be dropped or completely twisted beyond repair. I don't anticipate that Netflix will let them do someone like Philippa Eilhart because if Philippa Eilhart got adapted straight from the page to a TV show made by Netflix, everyone would call them homophobic because Philippa Eilhart is a lesbian and she's also one of the most devious mass manipulator villains in the Witcher series and they're not going to let something like that fly. Or if Philippa does appear, she is going to be incredibly whitewashed to the point where she's not even going to resemble herself anymore. I also fear what they're going to do to the Rats storyline in a potential future season because the Rats are also supposed to be incredibly despicable, hateable characters who bring Siri to her lowest low. And I could very easily see a Netflix adaptation completely turn them into some bullshit allegory for the freedom of youth or turn them into actual Robin Hood-esque characters to once again spit polish all the dirty, grime, and edginess that was there in the original work. You know, all the stuff that actually made it fucking interesting and fun to read in the first place.